Its mission is to link proven leaders in service to Hampton Roads. Tonight, we begin a three-part series on regional leadership with a look at the Civic Leadership Institute. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. It's one of the most influential organizations you've probably never heard of. Last month, the Civic Leadership Institute celebrated the start of its 15th year of service in Hampton Roads. Tonight, we begin a three-part series on regional leadership organizations, and we start with one that I have to admit is pretty close to home. In the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you that in addition to hosting programs here at WHRO, I have the pri privilege of serving as executive director of Civic. Each year, a group of 35 to 45 leaders become part of a class. They spend one day together each month learning about the region and its challenges. And joining us for the discussion tonight is Dan Bell, a member of the class of 2009 and the president of Canon Information Technology Services. Captain Charles Melker is a member of the class of 2010. He is also the commanding officer of Naval Support Activity Norfolk. And Alexis Swan is the regional director at Wachovia Wealth Management, where she oversees about 15 private wealth managers. Good evening, and thanks to all of you Thank for you. being with us tonight. Um, you know, I mean, I, I got to, again, full disclosure, uh, this is an organization I've sort of watched grow up over time, and all of you have come into it at varying points. So uh, it, it kind of brings us to a conversation about the role of an organization like this in the community. Uh, Dan Bell, you're currently uh, on the board for Civic, and, I, and you mm -hmm. came from a, another community, which is why I'm interested in your perspective absolutely. about this organization and what it's doing here. Well, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really kind of the peak of, of my leadership tours within the region. And again, it is regional. We have people from the north side, the south side. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to engage with other senior leadership personnel in the region. And not just to demonstrate leadership, but to engage in active community involvement. Yeah, and, and that's really the key of it all. And it happens mm -hmm. so often behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. In a few moments, we'll show you some of the ways that it's it's taking place right here in Hampton Roads. Uh, Alexis Swan, the, the relationships, it seems to me, are really key to what makes this organization work. And Dan was talking about this idea of connections at a very, very uh, senior level. And it seems to me that I've often heard it said it's lonely at the top. Well, it's great just to have some peers that you could sit down and talk about some of the common issues that you deal with. Yeah. And it's great that it's regional because personally, I live in York County, but I actually work here in Norfolk. So it allows me to, to meet peers on both sides of the water. We have some of the same interests and yeah. some of the same concerns. Sure. So it, it's a great way to kind of have a, a peer group to work with. Sure. Uh, and Captain Chuck Melker, one of the things I really have appreciated about Civic over the years is the degree of involvement of high-ranking military people like yourself. Uh, and, and I wonder what it is when you think about, uh, and so many of them wind up retiring here, which is a, a great gift to the community in so many ways. What is it about this region, do you think, that makes it attractive when you think about all the places that they live and have been stationed? Um, the primary thing about Hampton Roads is it is a city, but it is also a small community. It's not unlike where I grew up in Boston in many ways, geographically, ethically, um, and the even though you retire from here, there are many opportunities to work. Um, sure. and, and more than that, you, you can still be near a military community, but be part of a civilian community. And that's oh. a piece that many people in the military don't have in, unless you set down roots and stay in a place for one yeah. period of time. So, so, so for you in the, the class that you've just finished, you were the most uh, in the most recent class. Um, what has that experience been like to meet other people who are in the same level but in the civilian sector? Uh, it couldn't be, have been a more valuable experience for me in a, in a bunch of levels. Uh, for me personally, uh, as I said, w typically military comes and goes in a community relatively quickly, a couple of years, three, mm -hmm. four years. Um, my wife and I have had the privilege of living here for nine. Uh, we moved 11 times in 20 years and then have, have been here for nine. So that uh, this is the first time in our, our life that we've had more acquaintances and friends that were civilians than military. Oh, interesting. Uh, that said, uh, we never had an opportunity, I never had an opportunity to interact with the senior leaders that come to Civic right. uh, from all walks of life. And we had, as you know, lawyers, bankers, uh, yeah. uh, a few other military, but, uh, and, and I've established some friends from that class that I know will 
you know, last me the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things as I hear you talk about that, I think some people may have the idea that it sounds it's sort of elitist in a certain sense, but there's a real method to the madness of bringing people together at that level. Mm -hmm. it, it has to do with the kinds of resources that you have available mm -hmm. to you and what you can do with them. Uh, truly, it, in uh, in addition to the experience that senior people bring to uh, to the class, um, there's that network, that bond. And in, in fact, uh, uh, I thought it was a great privilege, and always do, to be involved in senior military people. It uh, always amazes me, and and I'm so thankful for their presence and what they do for our country. But the level of training that that one sees from the military, senior people in the military, is phenomenal. Uh, so it, it it truly is a it's a bond and a network that. Uh, um, allows us to leverage the skills that we collectively bring to the party and then deploy them through the region together. And deploy them through the region mm -hmm. in service to the region, which Absolutely. I think is the other the key point. And Alexis, as I was hearing Chuck talk about that, I thought, I really don't think there's another place where you would, as a civilian, have the interaction uh, with uh, with the military in quite this way. No, I don't, I don't believe so. Yeah. And, and the way the program works, where we all get to talk about some of the major issues and just hearing the different perspectives and what military um, personnel bring to the table is from other regions right. that are struggling with some of the same things. I think it's interesting, too, because military people will often introduce something into the conversation because they have not been from here. And so they don't, you know, I think there, some of us have been here a while, start a conversation at a level mm -hmm. because we think, well, you know, you can't consider that, that, and that because we just don't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, military personnel will come and say, well, have you ever considered this, this, or this? Right. And, you know, and, and it really, it sort of opens the whole thing up a bit and, and sort of gets us out of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. which, is, which is really important. One of the things I would wonder if you would speak to is um, the behind the scenes what happens out of those relationships? Because it's great to have relationships, but then you have to sort of deploy those in a way that's meaningful for the community. Well, certainly not everybody um, in any particular class bonds as, as much mm -hmm. as everybody else. It's a, it's a hit or miss thing. There's, there's personalities, there's roles. And, uh, and for instance, to this day, I still get together with people from my class, which was the class of 09. And, uh, and we, we oftentimes engage in, in common interests, areas of interest on, on a variety of projects mm -hmm. in the region, whether it be boards, um, or other projects. So it's, uh, you know, once you establish that connection with, with uh, certain people in the class, you, you have the opportunity yeah. to go on for years. Uh, you know, Chuck, I know that one of the things that your group or your class, some people in your class sort of came together around is, uh, is this idea that there are a lot of uh, that you get your eyes open to a lot of aspects and segments of the community that you but, might not have otherwise really been focused on. You, you bet. Um, particularly, uh, I think it was the first or second day, we did uh, housing, uh, econ economics, food bank, those right. sorts of things. That, uh, for me, uh, that, was a, that was an eye-opening experience. And, and I've been able to turn that around and use that with my sailors, frankly. How so? Um, uh, the discussion that was particularly poignant was at the beginning of that day, they did a basic uh, budget for a family of four, if you remember that mm -hmm. exercise, um, and what jumped off the page at me was the salary that a family of four has to uh, make mm -hmm. to stay in a home, to not become homeless. Mm -hmm. um, and I took that back to uh, my office, and that day I had a petty officer walk in and she was telling me she was about to have her, her third child, and that was great, and her husband was deployed. And I started asking her some questions along that line, and I realized how close to the line some of our petty officers are. I mean, that helped me as a military leader, uh, not necessarily as a member of the community, but it helped me bring that back to my my, my particular command, but also sure. to the people I work for. Because human um, issues are become... Because human issues uh, interblend. Issue, right? yeah. most, most people miss the fact that of the... 80,000 active duty military in Hampton Roads, there's only about 4,000 of them that live on a Navy base. The rest mm -hmm. of us are scattered throughout Hampton Roads from Yorktown uh, all the way down to Suffolk and even into North Carolina. Um, we are members of the community, mm -hmm. so we have the same issues, um, same cost issues, same recession issues, same work issues, yeah. same child care, on and on. And I wonder, Alexis, is you think about the work that, that your class has done and some of the, the boards and commissions upon which these folks serve. It's a, pretty, uh, it's a pretty amazing set of skills they bring to this process. So as you think about your work and about the work of others, uh, how did this organization influence that for you? I mean, I think you were pretty active coming into it anyway. I was, but yeah. it also um, provided a whole new pool of people to 
pull into projects right. that I may be involved with, such as Habitat for Humanity. Right. Um, also, it gave me some partners to go run some things around when you're going through some um, difficulties with the banking sure. industry and sure. you want to know if this the, you're the only one feeling like this and to have someone who maybe have had some of the sa same struggles, yes. different industry, yeah. um, has helped me as well. And, so and I, it's been invaluable. I, I, we won't get into the specifics of this, uh, this but I, what I remember particularly about your class, about you particularly, and I value it to this day, is uh, what you brought to the table in terms of educating everybody about issues of diversity in ways that go beyond sort of the normal way we, we think about mm -hmm. that. Ways that I think a lot of people don't even, it, what our good friend Phyllis Henderson, who's a marvelous diversity consultant on the peninsula, would call a naive offense. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody means anything by what they're saying, mm -hmm. but still the opportunity to be in a group of people where there's a trust level built up so that you can say, you know, I know you didn't mean it, exactly. but this is how this kind of comes across. Yeah, funny you should say that. I was sharing that story just the other day. Yeah. How, you know, it's really important for us to look to the heart of people yeah. and to understand intent versus impact. And so a, a lot of my diversity learning has come through my job. I've done a lot. I'm a champion through my job. And um, unfortunately, there's a lot of positions when you get certain level in the bank, you are the diversity champion. Um, but I, my parents have always taught me to, to value the opinions of others. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's important to have open dialogue yeah. about that kind of thing. Because what good is it if you're offended and you don't share? Because it doesn't correct the offense. Yes. And also, it doesn't help your feelings. Sure. So, you know, I've always made a point that if I feel that, that I share. Because yeah. I believe that the. Or if the somebody else feels it and shares it, which I think was exactly. this. Somebody else felt exactly. and shared it with you, didn't feel comfortable sharing yeah. it. And you had a marvelous way of just exactly. saying, hey, I just want to let you know. Yeah. It, was, it was a really great moment, but that exactly. doesn't happen unless there's an existing relationship, well, which I think, I think is right. what's so important. Oh, you have to feel in your, you're in a safe place. Right. And that's what I think I liked about Civic, yeah. is you spent some time building yeah. relationships. Those activities helped you feel like you're in a safe environment to yeah. say, you know, that probably didn't come across right. That didn't feel real good. Sure. And let me tell you why. Yeah. yeah so those great things are point. important. Uh, Civic is certainly very much a, a behind the scenes organization, providing some very high quality leadership for regional boards and organizations across the region. And its impact is really deep and wide, and it's seen and unseen. Last month at the Half Moon Cruise and Celebration Center, the organization shared some of its stories class by class. And as you might imagine, it's a pretty competitive type A bunch of people. <laughs> they cannot quite agree on which was the best class, but they certainly agreed that their founder emeritus had left quite a mark. when you think of Civic Leadership Institute, there's just really one name that comes to mind. Joshua P. Darden, Jr. Josh Darden. Josh Darden. Josh Darden. Josh Darden. Josh Darden. Well, Josh was there at the beginning. So was attorney Toy Savage and former Norfolk Mayor Joe Leaf. They had all noticed that they were having trouble getting a new generation to step up and become trustees of Hampton Roads. So they developed just enough of a program to get things started. So with that, we struck off and uh, struggled. It was a couple of years before we got our uh, understanding of how this thing had to happen. Uh, Kathy and I remember the days when we really weren't sure we were going to be here. It was sort of a, you know, held the checks in the drawer until you could cover them. Uh, but we got through that and we had, uh, Kay Kemper was a big factor in, in that success in keeping us go going. We had two one-day classes in 96 and they were so successful we took off 97 to retool and then came back with uh, a class of 98. I'm Paul Robinson. I was the president of the board for Southampton Roads Habitat for Humanity back in 2006. I was also in the civic class of 2003. Back in 2006 with Habitat, we were starting to do the Blitz build, where we build a large group of houses all in one week. It's an enormous endeavor. I brought Chip Slavin from my class onto the board, and he got involved with the Blitz build and actually took it over and ran it. And he brought together the greatest group of people to build these houses in Portsmouth. Two years later, 
he put together the biggest blitz build in the country, building 16 homes in Suffolk in five days. In the interim, he brought on some civic alumni onto the board, which strengthened the board incredibly. Civic's had a tremendous impact in the community, but it's also been the genesis for some extraordinary friendships. I'd never met Anne. I grew up in Newport News. She grew up in Seaford, and we never knew each other. Old line families on the peninsula, in the business community, and we never knew each other. How we missed each other, I don't know. I don't know either, but I am so glad we met. One of my dearest, closest friends came to me through Civic. Steffens gave a guest presentation on anti-terrorism and it was pretty clear we needed him in the next class. I uh, met Thaler McCormick who was this uh, bleeding heart liberal social worker uh, that was dealing with uh, you know, homeless people. Tom and I didn't have a whole lot in common in class and I thought he was kind of an uptight you know military guy. Frankly our my, my comments were even on those days where, uh, well, you know, they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get on with it. After the Katrina experience, I realized that something was different, and uh, I came back with my hat in my hand and said, Taylor, tell me more about this problem. Then I met the kids. That's, that ends it. Then now you're hooked forever. So I was walking out the door. She says, well, Tom, now that you have your homelessness block checked, what are you going to do about it? When he left that day, he had told me he was volunteering um, at the Red Cross, and I had said, well, hey, if you are done with the work you're doing with Red Cross and you have some spare time, we could really use you to shoot hoops with the kids at the shelter. And that is what hooked Tom Steffens. Go! Come on! That's those rebounders! Oh, sure. And that, that those famous last words, yeah, we just want you to shoot hoops with the kids. Right. But I told Thaler very clearly that day that I was not, not going to be a member of her board. I mean, I... I'll come and play basketball with the kids. And what are you today? And today I'm the president of the board of directors of four kids. <laughs> and I'm loving every minute of it. I don't think anybody got a bigger bang for the county's buck than Eric Williams, who came to Civic during his first year as York County School Superintendent. First, Eric leveraged his civic relationships into an informal advisory group made up of several of his classmates. I also was able to connect up another one of my classmates, Shay Henderson, with one of the high school principals in our school division. And this principal was looking for someone to do workshops relating to school climate, relationships, and also diversity matters. And so Shay's been working with this principal, her students, and staff during this school year. Another connection I made was with Carol Simpson, provost of OD University. And ODU has a China initiative and we offer Chinese foreign language instruction within our division. So we've been able to work together and get some ideas from learning about each other's work. Hello, I'm Greta Harrison. Through the magic of Civic, when I met with my small group and we had to do a partnership and do some kind of project, I thought about first book, I mentioned it to them, and all the team said yes right away. And I was so grateful for that. When they jumped on board, I said, you know, guys, this is not just a one-shot thing. We're going to start something that's going to continue. It's going to outlive us. We're starting something for the area. And we want this to be a regional project, which is part of Civic's inspiration. And they all said, yes, we're not in here just until we graduate. We're going to be in, in this for the long haul. So because of that, I have a large group from my Civic class who weren't even in my small group. Captain Pat Trapp came up to me and volunteered to work with us. He was not part of our group, but he said, I know about First Book, I want to help, and he has been a, an instrumental part of our getting off the ground. Greta is a force to be reckoned with, and uh, you know, it, it was just so difficult to even say no, but there was nothing to say no to. When given the opportunity to participate in a program like First Book, uh, there's really no question about it. There's really no time that you need to make a decision. When you have an opportunity to, to change lives, to, to uh, share with uh, our youth today, the, uh, the magic of getting uh, something they can open, they can turn to, they can look at, they can smell the pages of the book. Uh, it's just something that you, you selfishly look forward to doing on a daily basis. At the heart of just about everything Civic does is the power of relationships, regional relationships for regional results. 
and that's as true today as it was in the beginning. I can't thank Josh Darden enough for having the vision to put together a program like this. I think for new leaders coming into corporate positions or any position, it is a great way to enhance what you do at work and in the community. If there's a single thing that I think comes out of this, aside from getting to know a lot of people you, you ought to know, it's that they, uh, all of a sudden you have 40-some people who come out uh, empowered and knowledgeable and uh, interested in the community and really feeling like, gee, uh, there are a lot of good people here who share my views and I think if we work together, we can make a difference. One of the great things about Josh Darden, and I, he is famous for saying this, and he's so right, says you can accomplish a lot when you don't care who gets the credit. I just think that's hmm. amazing. That's and great. I think the, the leaders who function at this level of things, uh, you know, they, they sort of have that philosophy as well. The understanding that it takes a lot of people uh, to get things done, no question about it. So, Dan Bell, you, uh, how, what, what does it mean to have people... Uh, because one of the things we know is that this is an organization to which one must be nominated. You can't mm -hmm. just sort of fill out an application and join. Some people wonder why that's the case. What, what, uh, what would you say to that? Well, I think that, uh, that civics strength is the, the collective um, experience, energy, of the senior people that it brings to the to the class and uh, and certainly along the way as we're as we're younger people in our careers we're learning we're learning all the time the opportunity here is to 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 harvest that collective skill set and really put it to work and so we're getting to the point of these are senior people in whatever business military etc community and what have you learned in in your career and what can you leverage off of or, or learn from others in civic and what can you apply it to? So it's really that harvesting of energy and skills and experience mm. at the senior levels I think makes the big difference with civic leadership. Yeah, uh, the, one of my favorite stories and one we did not uh, put in that report we just did uh, ha and it has to do with we can't name names here because a lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes and you have to really connect the dots to know how it all comes back. Uh, but there were two f folks who were in, uh, in the same civic Class. They had just started out together. So they really didn't know each other very well. Uh, one was the chair of a local nonprofit. The other was a banker. And the, this was a pretty significant nonprofit. And the nonprofit was saying, you know, we're having a little problem with payroll. It's absolutely a cash flow issue. Uh, and the bank was getting ready to say, too bad, so sad. So the chair of the board called the banker, and they got on the phone together and uh, and talked it out. And the banker said. You know, it, certainly the due diligence had to be there without a doubt, but he said truly it was the strength of that relationship mm -hmm. that they had built and the credibility that they were both in the same group together that really made it easier to say, yes, we're going to go with you on this. And and as the, and the the board chair was absolutely on the money, the checks cleared, everything was fine, uh, you know, and it's one of those situations that could have been embarrassing mm -hmm. all the way around, mm -hmm. didn't have to be. And I, I just love those kinds of stories. It happens all the time, and, and that's one of the great things about what happens behind the scenes. Uh, so, Chuck Melker, 2010, you've now graduated. Uh, what do you do with this experience on the other side of it? Uh, the, the irony is uh, I've already been asked to join a board of a, of a local nonprofit through personal connection uh, I made in mm -hmm. the class. Uh, it has given me a completely different perspective on how I address uh, community issues to my chain of command as well. Oh, interesting. Um, uniquely, and you touched on this earlier, uh, the conversations that happen in those rooms uh, were immediately broken down. I mean, mm -hmm. first off, you, some of that is because you have senior people who are taking a significant amount of time out of their Huge a, out of their work. You're committing to mm -hmm. ten work days essentially uh, that you're going to come and, and do this and 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 meet and and learn and understand and. Uh, so the conversations, that builds an element of trust right away. Mm -hmm. And then the conversations flow pretty quickly uh, as you addressed. And the, the wideness of the audience, nothing was off limits. That's a fact. Um, Nothing's off limits. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being with us today. And thank you for your leadership as well, which has been extraordinary in all of your uh, arenas. I'll be back in a moment with a final thought.
Like so many good things in Hampton Roads, Josh Darden was the quiet force behind the creation of the Civic Leadership Institute. It's one of two organizations about which he is most proud. The other is the Access Scholarship Foundation, which he co-founded with another Hampton Roads philanthropic giant, the late Frank Batten. Several civic leaders back in the 50s donated $2,350 apiece to create the Norfolk Foundation. 30 years later, another group of citizens formed the Virginia Beach Foundation with a similar mission. In January, those two organizations joined forces and became greater than the sum of the parts. In February, Mr. Darden was honored by 40 friends and co-workers, many of whom he had helped set up in the auto business he knew so well. They have contributed more than $1.2 million to an endowment to give scholarships to Southampton Roads public school students who will attend college. Organizations like Civic and Lead Hampton Roads and Lead Peninsula and Lead Historic Triangle, about which you will learn more in the coming months, are incubators for the next generation of Josh Darden's and Frank Batten's. And if the next generation cares half as much for the region, we will be in very good hands. You can watch this program again or any of our past ones at our website, whatmatters.tv. That's where you can also send us an email, join our Facebook page, and sign up for our weekly newsletter where we'll let you know what we're working on as soon as we know what we're working on. For more local talk, I hope you'll join us on the radio dial for Hearsay on 89.5 WHRV. I listen in live every weekday at noon, and we will take your calls. Thanks again for watching. I'm Kathy Lewis, and we'll see you next time for another look at What Matters. Thank <laughs> you.